Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, just before we start, um, just uh, so want to see some hands about who even knows what a semantic layer is or has heard about it. No, at scalers, don't raise your hand. <laughs> okay, so about half. Um, so what I'm going to do today is hopefully demystify the semantic layer. I mean, the semantic layer is kind of an abstract concept because it is an abstraction layer. So <laughs> it's meant to be kind of abstract. But what I'm going to do today is make it real for you. Uh, and the way I'm going to make it real is uh, I'm going to show you a, a couple slides just to set up what a semantic layer is and why you should care and how you could use one and how it can improve the business. Um, but then I'm going to show you one live uh, and show, you, show it to you how actually a semantic layer in action from creating a semantic model to consuming it across a variety of different uh, consumer endpoints. And so you can see the experience and you can hopefully see what a, a semantic layer in practice looks like. So let's just start with um, a definition. Uh, if you do a, a Google search for semantic layer, um, this Wikipedia definition comes up and I think it's pretty darn good. Uh, and the reason why I like it is that it talks about a business representation of data um, and it's using common business terms. And I also like that word, those words, allowing end users to access data autonomously. So let's unpack that for a second. You know, what does that all mean? Well, what it means is that uh, for data to be really um, um, a, a game changer for an organization, everybody needs to use data to make decisions. And um, I, I've kind of seen over the years, because I'm an old guy, um, sort of us fall back into before we could use data and a lot of people were using data with BI tools and the like, and now you kind of have to be a SQL expert even with tools like Tableau and Power BI, you have to understand the data and how to model it and understand how it's physically represented or even know how to go get it or even know how to log on to go get it before you can actually make decisions. So um, a semantic layer is meant to make data available for everyone. And that means everyone um, in, in, in going to where the users uh, spend their time. And we all know that most users and most business users love Microsoft Excel and spreadsheets. Um, in addition to the traditional tools like, uh, like uh, Power BI or Tableau. So that means that a semantic layer needs to speak the language of a business user, which means we got to speak um, with terms like revenue and gross margin um, and, uh, and month and quarter, um, instead of dealing with um, you know, parquet files and, and delta files in a data lake somewhere. So um, if we know that you know, a semantic layer then can, uh, can become that, that business layer, where does it sit? So semantic layers aren't new. They've been around since um, business objects sort of coined the term um, the business uh, objects universe, and that was back in the 80s. The difference with today and, and what we're talking about with today's semantic layers is that they're universal. And they stand alone, separate and distinct from how you consume the data as well as how you store the data. So you can see in the picture over here on the right um, that the semantic layer really is a separate component in the stack. And by making it a separate component in the stack, it gives you the opportunity to centralize your business logic, centralize your governance logic, um, and, and do that all in one place, regardless of whether your consumers are a data scientist who's using a Jupyter Notebook, uh, a business analyst who's using Excel or Power BI, or an application developer who's writing uh, 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 Java um, or C++ uh, to build applications for data. So if we do that, and if we have the semantic layer live on its own, now we can provide this consistency the single source of truth. And we've been talking about a single source of truth forever, and every BI vendor will say, I have a single source of truth. And I always argue that you, unless you have an environment where there's only one way of consuming data, and you have only one data platform that contains all your data, that's not achievable. Um, and that's where the semantic layer comes into play. So where does that fit in the stack? 
So what I'm going to show you today is that I'm going to show that, that that orange layer for data modeling is the key to the semantic layer. You've got to have a logical model to be able to embed and create that business logic and create that logical view of your physical data. So it is a new part of the stack. And, you know, and a lot, of, a lot of times people will say, well, you know, is that, it's another component in the stack. Doesn't that make things more complicated? And uh, what, what I argue is that it actually future-proofs your, uh, your infrastructure. Because we know that there's gonna be new ways of consuming data in the future. We also know there's gonna be new ways of storing data in the future. So if you don't embed the business logic in those consumer tools like a Power BI or like a Tableau, you're now free to plug and play on the back end. So you can see on the data API la layer that there could be a, a, a cloud data warehouse you're talking to. You could be talking to a data lake like, like a Databricks Lakehouse, which is the demo I'm gonna give you today. You also have data that's locked away in SaaS applications like Salesforce and ServiceNow. Um, and NetSuite. And all those are data sources that would require a consumer to know and have to understand how to connect to that data and also how, what, how it was represented before they can actually get a simple number like revenue for revenue, revenue for last month or predicted revenue for the future. Uh, so you can also see that the data catalog runs along the side. A semantic layer interacts with the enterprise data catalog. A data catalog is a great way of making uh, the semantic layers um, uh, discoverable, but it's not a data catalog on its own. And so, but it's a, an important part of the ecosystem. So now let's talk about the top. So um, people consume obviously with BI tools uh, and, and those are the business users. Well, people also, data scientists also are, are creating their ML models on, and, and they need to get access to data as well. And they're not only reading data, they're also writing data. Because with those ML models, they're actually creating new features and they're creating new, um, new, new features, new attributes, uh, new predictions. And those need to be written back to the semantic layer. So now you can kind of see something interesting here. You know, when you think about the full spectrum of analytics from descriptive which is what happened, what happened and answers that question, to diagnostic, why did it happen? That tends to be in the realm of business, of the BI tools. But then with, with AI and ML, it's predictive, what will happen? And then prescriptive, well, what am I gonna do about it if it happens? And so now the semantic layer can become that, 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 that common thread that links those teams together, including the application developers who all want that same consistent view of the business, um, regardless of whether they're baking it into an application, regardless of whether we're creating a um, machine learning model, or regardless of whether we're creating dashboards or reports um, um, for our data products. So I'm not gonna go into all these. These are all sort of the, um, the core components of what a semantic layer needs to do. It's, it, it needs to connect, everything needs to connect to it. And today I'm gonna to show you that um, very vastly different ways of connecting to these tools because the semantic layer needs to work natively with the tools. And that's really, really important. I'm gonna show, show you how I'm gonna integrate directly without moving data out of, Databricks, out, of, out of a Databricks SQL endpoint. It stays in, in Databricks and I'm gonna show you how it's lightning fast because the semantic layer automatically tunes performance, as well as being in that governance layer. You don't need a separate governance layer if you have your business logic and your governance rules all in one place. And so I'm gonna show you how, how that all fits together. So um, what you're gonna see in, in the demo today is that I'm gonna do more than just this, but you can see um, in at scale semantic layer, I'm gonna create the model that you see on the left using our design tool. And that is the semantic layer. It's called internet sales. That internet sales then, you can see how it would appear in Tableau, Excel, Power BI, Looker. Um, I'm also gonna show you how it looks like in a JDBC client. I'm gonna also show you how it looks like in a Jupyter Notebook. So you're gonna get a full view of how that semantic layer looks. And then how you use a semantic layer. These are some of the use cases. Um, you might be hearing a lot about a metric store 
A metric store is just another synonym for a semantic layer. DBT is talking about a semantic layer. Um, and so it's, we also have uh, uh, Google uh, with Looker talking about a semantic layer. We have other, other companies like, um, like Cube.io and the like are talking about headless BI. Um, those are all synonyms for a semantic layer. I happen to like a semantic layer because I think it covers all the use cases. Um, what you're also going to see is that, at least in at scale sense, the semantic layer is fully multi dimensional. That's really a key part of making the data approachable. The business speaks in terms of measures, dimensions, and hierarchies. So it's a very, very natural language. I already talked about how we can bridge AI and BI. And I'm also going to show you how we're going to make a Databricks SQL screen. OK, so here's the demo today. Um, I'm going to show you how um, you can see all the sort of different tools on, on the right hand side. They're going to connect into that at scale semantic layer. And the at scale semantic layer is actually going to publish these different protocols. So it's very important that you can't just speak to a semantic layer using SQL. Yes, it needs to support SQL, but Power BI and Excel don't like to speak SQL. They like to speak XMLA. Um, Looker does, likes to speak LookML. Um, and so you have to integrate that. You're also going to see that in the middle there, we call it the diamond layer, um, that on top of the Databricks gold layer, these are the, the actual, um, that's where the semantic layer lives, in the form of new tables, and, and we're going to create aggregate tables to accelerate performance. And that's all going to be done on the fly. So um, without further ado, let's just get into it here. OK. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is you see uh, what we call design center. This is our canvas for how we build the semantic layer. This over here is the canvas. What you see on the right is a preview of the dimensions, attributes, and hierarchies that we're going to create. It's this view that you see for preview is what the end consumers are going to see. What you see on the canvas is you see objects. So we're able to take data straight out of the Databricks cluster. We don't move it. We're just referencing it. And we're also able to create um, other models and share and connect to those other models. So if you notice uh, on this customer uh, dimension, that is actually a model a a as well. Um, and you can see here that the customer dimension model is also made up of two other models. Um, and those two other, that, that, like the geography dimension is made up of four different tables in its own model. So everybody talks about data mesh. Data mesh using a semantic model where you're able to create these common assets and then share across the organization and across different domains and allow those users to connect them together is super powerful. Because now you can have the domain owners creating in finance, creating finance models that can share with marketing to connect to their marketing models. And now you can do a full ROI across your marketing spend without having to understand all the logic that comes with the finance model. You can also have conformed dimensions. In this case, this is our geography dimensions. Everybody's going to speak geography and time the same way. OK, enough said. So let's, let's go and um, let's actually create a new model. Uh, and it, this is going to be uh, my web store. So I'm creating something from scratch here. Uh, and I'm going to go into my canvas, and I'm going to have a blank page here. So what am I operating on? I'm operating on a Databricks uh, small cluster. This is, on, this is Azure Databricks. I'm using a SQL endpoint, um, and you can see it's, it's a small size. Okay. So how do I get my data? Well, we have our data sources panel here. So I just connected the semantic layer to these different data platforms. Um, and Databricks, of course, is, is one of them that you saw there. And then I have all my schemas. I don't have to actually describe this. We're just connecting with JDBC. So all that you see here is, you know, is, is, is available to you. So I'm going to use this sales log uh, table because it has all of my transactions for my web store. So now by dragging it on the canvas, I'm going to double click it to, to, to preview it, I can now explore and start to create transformations on top of that, 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 that raw data 
um, in, my, uh, in my cluster. These are just delta tables um, in, uh, in Databricks. So um, you can see I have my preview here. I also have, uh, I also have um, the ability to do things like um, clean up some data, like I want to clean up my nulls uh, with um, some unknowns, um, and I can go ahead and preview that. That will create that transformation in place. Okay, so now I can use that clean field in my semantic layer versus the field that has um, dirty data. I can also create calculations from scratch. And I'm going to create my first calculation. I'm going to call it sales tax. And uh, I'm going to write a formula. How am I writing the formula? Uh, this is just Databricks SQL. So anything that Databricks SQL can support, including all your you know, user-defined functions and the like, automatically get inherited. So important part of the semantic layer, important, um, a very important uh, requirement is that you pass the work down to the underlying data platform, Databricks in this case. We're not gonna be taking data out and creating our own cube or our own space. The data stays in the cluster. So you can see now, I now have my sales tax uh, column. There it is right there in, my, in what we call a data set. And now I'm gonna use it by adding it to my, my, my model um, that I just, I just defined. And I'm gonna put it into a folder and voila, I got my very first metric uh, called sales tax. So let's add some other metrics. I'm gonna add in my order quantity. I'm also gonna put it in a folder. I'm gonna put in, let's see, I, I, got, I wanna know what, how much my customers are buying, so I'll put in the sales amount, and that's the total amount of purchase. So now I have three metrics. So, so far, so good. It's not very interesting if you can't group by and you can't cut by and slice and dice. So this is where I'm gonna use my, uh, and bring in some of my other models that my other data stewards have created or I have authored uh, myself in a library. So I can now bring in my customer model that you saw earlier. I can bring in my product model and I'm gonna bring in, of course, my date dimension, my date model. Now, all I need to do here with these models, these are all self-contained, and you can decide how you want to share them or the like. Very important part of the semantic layer is reusability and encapsulation. Like every good developer knows, you want to be able to encapsulate that logic. So now what I do is I can just connect up by creating what we call a relationship to those models with my sales log data. So now look what happened. By connecting it up, I get everything that was in that model, including all the attributes as well as the hierarchies that have been defined in that geography model that was embedded in my customer model. So it travels along with it. That's super powerful because it means now that finance and uh, marketing um, are all going to be using this same customer model. I can also do that with the same thing. I have my, uh, my product uh, dimension. So I'll, I'll do that and I'll connect up my product dimension. And voila, there's my product hierarchy and my, my product uh, attributes. Watch what happens with time. I got order, order dates and I have ship dates. Time has always been just, uh, just the thorn in my side when I'm trying to, trying to create a model or visualization. I can take that order date, prefix it with an order prefix and watch what happened. Now I have all of the, 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 the date hierarchy with all the logic and all the different attributes and now it says order. And I can do the same thing with ship. This is what we call role playing dimensions. Uh, and that's really powerful because now I know that regardless of how I'm reporting, whatever the time field is, you can see now there's ship date, I'm always gonna be rolling it up the same exact way. So, per, so far, so good. Um, before I go, I'm gonna, I have some nested data. So today, data is always nested. I got some key value pairs. Uh, I'm gonna explode those out in the semantic layer. I'm gonna do it by in, inputting my keys, color and style, and those become now virtual columns that I'm gonna turn into dimensions in my model. Okay, so I now have a pretty good model here. Um, what I also had, once I went pretty fast, is I also had, um, I, I created that uh, in my customer dimension, 
I also created um, a, what we call a security dimension. I'm filtering users by location. And this is super powerful because now because I used that customer dimension, all the filtering by location comes for free. So I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna log in as David and David can see uh, North America and I'm gonna log in as Joe who can only see um, uh, Europe. And so I'll show you how that works. Also, I can create what we call perspectives. Uh, and perspectives allow me to do things like hide PII. So I'll call it uh, web, my web store. Um, and no PII. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll go ahead and say, in my customer dimension, I definitely don't want users with this perspective to be able to access my customer names, my customer PII. So now if I go to my preview, I now have another model automatically that shows that it's no PII. And you can see there's no customer identifying fields there. Okay, let's go and let's now publish this. So I have my model for my web store. Um, I'm going to, I'm gonna set up some security on it because I said that I don't, want, uh, I don't want Joe to get access to the full model, so I'm gonna take access away from Joe, but I am gonna give Joe access to the, uh, the no PII model, just like that. Um, and now I'm ready to publish. And as I publish, I'm gonna check this publish to Looker, um, because as we're publishing, what we're doing is we're pushing that semantic model, which is just a XML definition. So it's not data, it is just a, a virtual mapping of the physical to the logical. And I also publish that data to Looker, which I'll show you in a second. Okay, so um, ready to go. So let's start with, um, with, with looking at uh, my web store and I'm gonna first start with Tableau. Uh, so, and, and then I'm gonna move to Looker, I'll move to Power BI, I'll show you Excel, I'll show you a Jupyter Notebook, uh, and I'll even show you if we have time, um, I don't wanna do admin, remember I said I wanted to log in as David? And now I'm logging in using my Active Directory credentials into the at scale semantic layer, which I'm now gonna see, hopefully is gonna say, my web store, there it is. And there's all those attributes that I just included in that model, all nicely organized and very user friendly. So I'm now live querying here. So I just ran uh, order quantity. Remember I had that product hierarchy, product rolls into category and line. And voila, I have a live query that's running against my Databricks SQL cluster. No pre-aggregation, no queue building. This is all on the fly and this is all live. I'm live connected, I'm not using a data extract. Uh, let's look at, um, you remember I had my security dimension, um, and let's see if, if I'm David, I should only see North America. So I do, I only see Canada and United States. Uh, remember we had um, those key value pairs in the form of color and style. So um, I can do that, and voila, the semantic layer automatically unpacked that nested data and made it available as a dimension without any extra ETL or any kind of coding work. And then um, finally, uh, you remember we had those dates and we created the different dates by shipping and by orders. Um, well, um, because it's a, it's a multi-dimensional model, I can just go ahead and drill down just like I'm doing here in Tableau, very natural for your users, no pre-modeling necessary, um, and I got a really good experience. So now what's happening behind the scenes, which I'll show you, is that is that the semantic layer is actually building aggregate tables in, in, Databricks, in the Databricks cluster based on what I'm doing right now. So I am effectively tr training the semantic layer as I sort of click through and do this stuff. So let's look at, uh, let's look at what it might look like in, uh, in Looker. So I'm gonna come into Looker here and what you're gonna see is, you see how it says pull remote changes? What, it, what just happened is that we pushed and we wrote uh, uh, LookML to Looker directly, and there you have it, there's those models, there's my, y, my 
uh, my web store model that's now ready for, uh, for exploring. So I'll go to my explore view. Uh, you can see here's my web store right here. Right here. Um, and you can see in Looker, um, there's my folders that I defined in the semantic layer, just like you saw in Tableau. Here's my hierarchies. I'll do it by country. And now I'm running through Looker. I'm run using the same semantic layer, following the same rules. And there I have my data by, by country. Um, I'm logged in as the admin. That's why I see all my countries. And I also have the drill paths because those hierarchies have been defined in the semantic layer. So I can drill from country to city, uh, to country to state to city. What about, um, what about, the, what about Power BI? So how, how does it work for Power BI? So let's move to that. Um, for Power BI, you just saw that Looker communicated to at scale or to the semantic layer using LookML. You saw that Tableau was actually communicating to the semantic layer using SQL. Now we're going to go and we're going to load up uh, Power BI, and Power BI is going to communicate to the semantic layer over HTTP using the built-in analysis services connector. And you can notice I'm connecting live. So no more import mode, no more Power BI premium that you're going to spend you know, all that money for and be limited to memory. You can see there's my project, there's my web, my, my, my web store, and you can see that the only models that are available to me are the no PII models. That's because in Windows, I'm logged in as Joe. So now Joe can't even see that, the full model. He can only see the, the, the PII free model. But there you go. There's my same semantic layer, same folders. There's my same metrics that you saw me add. Uh, remember we had uh, that color, which was that nested field. Um, and now I just ran a live query in Power BI. Uh, and uh, if I look back at, let's see my Tableau, and look back at, at that, what you see is what you get. Same answer in Tableau, same answer in Power BI. And no modeling for PI, for, for Power BI. What you see here is that Power BI has inherited the semantic model. And that's because the interface that we're talking to the semantic layer in is, is DAX. And that's what Power BI wants to speak. So SQL is not good enough. So if you're looking at a semantic layer that only speaks SQL, you can't get this. Your users are still going to have to remodel data over and over again. What about Excel, the most popular tool on the planet for, for BI? Well, I connect the same way. I can just connect with the built-in analysis services connector. I can use my, um, my Active Directory uh, credentials. Um, I can pick uh, my project. Remember, there's my web, my, web, my web store, again, without PII. And I can create a pivot chart. Now I'm having my same semantic layer over here. Here you can see it. Um, again, same uh, experience for the end user. This time, we're speaking, uh, we're speaking um, uh, SQL. Uh, sorry, we're speaking um, MDX. OK. So uh, with uh, a Jupyter Notebook, um, if I go to my Jupyter Notebook, here's how I can connect to uh, AtScale. I can just connect to AtScale using um, Python. And then I can communicate with the, uh, the, the um, semantic layer just by getting my numerical features, for example, or uh, getting uh, my dimensions. Same semantic layer. Now for a data scientist. OK, so let's wrap it up. What was happening behind the scenes? I told you, I, I promised you, I'd let you see what was happening behind the scenes. So let's go to my queries panel. And let's look at this and look at what was happening here. So what you see here is you can see my web store. You can see those are the queries for Joe. And you can see those are my queries for David. Look what happened, though, it's in terms of this optimization column. What happened is that AtScale automatically built an aggregate table and then used it for the query. So if I look at this Looker query here, this is the Looker query that, that was ran. You can see the comment from Looker. This is what AtScale or, or the semantic layer intercepted. It was SQL based on LookML. What then the semantic layer did is it actually rewrote the query to use an aggregate table instead of the atomic data. So that's really powerful, because now we can return these queries super fast. 
Look at these queries here. They came in under uh, a millisecond. Um, so when, with the semantic layer and at scale, we're learning and we're taking all these different dialects. There's some SQL dialects, for example. Um, let's see, if I go to back to my Excel, uh, let's go and uh, I can turn those, that, this pivot table, I can turn it into formulas. So now they're different coordinates. See how now they're cube value functions? Um, now I can embed those individual coordinates anywhere I want in my, in my workbook. And when it comes time where I want fresh data, all I need to do is refresh, um, and I'm gonna get the data live from uh, Databricks. And that data is gonna be super fast. There you go, those 55 milliseconds, uh, well, under a second, about half a second, and there's the MDX that we intercepted. So that's kind of like a, a very fast view of, of, of how it all works, but um, I hope you could see that with a, with a semantic layer, you can create a single source of truth for reals this time, um, and you can provide a, a user experience that is native and built into those applications. So uh, I think we have a time for uh, time for just a couple questions. Is there any any, any questions that anybody has uh, in the audience? Uh, thank you for the demo. I think it's a very useful tool. Uh, when we make the semantic layer. Uh, if it is a snowflake schema, sometimes it forms the loops. Uh, is there any way uh, we can get the errors, like, you know, or the tool prevent making those relations? snowflake dimensions and, and so it, it does support that um, through those relationships so I, I, so I showed you the relationships between the models and a fact table we can have also build relationships between dimensions uh, to create snowflake dimensions so for certainly that's a really key point is that the semantic layer needs to support a multi-dimensional concept if you truly want to express the full richness of, of the business logic How does this work with uh, Unity Catalog? Um, how, so the question is, how, is it, how does this work with Unity Catalog? Well, first of all, it's integrated with Unity Catalog because if you notice when I actually was looking for my data to add to my model, we're just reading Unity Catalog and that's, and that's, and that's how we found that data. So we're connecting and supporting uh, th that Unity Catalog and anything that you do when it comes to uh, ACLs or uh, policies about access, we're gonna respect that because we're talking straight to Databricks. We're not taking the data out and doing our own thing with it, which is what a lot of other tools do, which breaks that model. Yeah, so the question is, um, do, you in the, do you track lineage in the um, semantic layer um, and uh, do you, does, it, does it map back to the Unity catalog? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And you know what? Look, you don't need to use our lineage because we do have the map here. Um, but we also integrate really nicely with tools like Alation and Calibra. Um, so that lineage is all there, and it's up to you how you want to consume it. You can consume it through uh, an enterprise data catalog, or you can get it through at scale through, those, through, our, through our models. David, this is great. I like the, the Alation and Calibra integration, right? Um, the question I have uh, is, I saw that your PII policies you are implementing within our scale. Is there a roadmap you have that when we implement the policies in the data governance and data catalog tool, it should get automatically propagated? In that way, we don't need to define in one in our scale, one in, in cataloging governance tool. Yeah. That's one. And I'll have one more, then you can answer together, right? I saw some aggregates coming through internally by at scale, optimization happening. Mm -hmm. um, how big of that? engine or server you're looking at for at scale, when I get data from multi-cloud, example, one from Snowflake, one from Google BigQuery, one from Databricks, now you're not talking about a single engine, right? And where does it execute it? What are you thinking about that engine behind the scene, please? Okay, Thank great. You. So when it comes to uh, policy syncing across the data catalog and the like, today it's one directional. At scale is publishing to the data catalogs. I definitely want to go the other direction because and so we sync those policies. So that's definitely on the roadmap. Um, in terms of multi-cloud, um, those models can be built and constructed and pointed to any of the data platforms that, that, we, that the semantic layer supports. 
Um, and so the customer, meaning the end user, doesn't know where that data is coming from. And that's the abstraction layer, and that's the beauty of it all. So uh, yeah, you can definitely use that layer. Uh, the at scale server is just a, uh, a, a very thin um, pizza box that you deploy in your own cloud infrastructure, and it acts as a listener and listens on those different ports. Now there's a, one, there's a couple more questions, but we're, we have 52 seconds. You want to keep I going? I think we're actually over. Oh, we're over? OK. OK. So um, Dave's going to be here. He's, he's not running away, so if you guys have other questions. Um. And, and, and also, we, uh, go at scale, we're here, we have a booth here at the show, so if you have more questions and you want to see detailed demos, we're at the back of the, of the um, room next to the, uh, the meeting rooms. So we're at the back of the, uh, the, uh, the conference center. Thank you. Thanks, Dave.